Menschen bewegen, Welt verändern als Salz und Licht. Weltbeweger. Gespräche über Gottes Wirken heute und Mission weltweit. Welcome to the podcast of Alliance Mission. Um, I have today Irene Wangi. Is that the right pronunciation? With me? Yes, perfect. 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 <laughs> um, yes, and we are talking about business for transformation in Kenya. So, Irene, you have the opportunity to uh, let's just explain uh -huh. what is B4T Kenya and what are you doing there? Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for inviting me for your podcast. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of it today. I totally appreciate. Like you said, my name is Irene Mwangi. I reside in Nairobi, Kenya. And this is where uh, B4T Kenya is based. So B4T Kenya is an organization that has two arms. The, the first arm, we have the Sisters for Hope. This is the mission part that goes out to reach out to women who are engaging in something we call poverty prostitute. Poverty prostitution is whereby the women are so poor in the slums and in the city streets of Nairobi, and even uh, they are so poor that they cannot uh, afford to take care of themselves or their children or their families. So they engage in prostitution for lack of anything else to do to raise money. So the, the Sisters for Hope is the arm of B4T Kenya that uh, reaches out to them. It goes to the slums and reaches out to these women with the love of Christ. And then on the other hand, we have the business arm of B4T Kenya that aims to start businesses that create employment opportunities for these women. Because we realized once you reach out to these women with the love of Christ and you tell them they are loved, they are accepted, they are valuable, they don't need to sell their bodies for money. After you preach to them and, 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 and uh, they, they, they start changing their minds and they start changing their behavior, there is a very big need to ensure that they have economic empowerment so that they don't so that they don't uh, go back to prostitution. That's so beautiful. this is what B4T Kenya does. Yeah, so it is. it has two arms, the mission arm, Sisters for Hope are our sister organization. And as we're on the business side, we have a, we have a holding company where uh, we are able to start various kinds of businesses and we are able to slowly, but in a very stable way, uh, increase and, uh, and open up opportunities to employ this wing. Yes. So... What are you doing in this uh, yeah, space of B14 in Kenya? What is your job? Yeah, so my job, Evelyn, is I am my position. The name of my position is CEO of uh, these companies. So we have a group of companies and I, my work is to implement the strategies that found these companies and cause these companies to grow sustainably. We run the companies as limited companies, so we need them to grow to a place where they are profitable and they can be able to pay their own bills, pay their salaries for these women and grow. Because when they grow, then we are able to create even more opportunities as the days go by. So this is my, my, this is my work. I head the management team for these companies. Well, that's an important job. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for like uh, putting your your efforts and your knowledge in this, so women can like have a good work, um, work in in dignity. So you. you grew up in poverty. You wrote me. Um, maybe you can explain what was that like for you to maybe understand better where these women come from. Yes, um, in in Kenya we have a very big unemployment problem. A lot of the people in Kenya, over sixty percent of the population, is living below the poverty line. When I say the poverty line, these are people who live on less than $2 a day. So when you look at the current living conditions and standards and expenses, it means that these people 
don't have enough money to buy or to access their basic needs. So a lot of families are going hungry. A lot of families don't have what they need just for a normal life. So I grew up in an area in Nairobi called the ghetto. I don't know if you have ghettos in Germany, but the ghetto is the kind of environment that is just a little above the slums. So we have the slums. These are people who are down low completely. They, are, they, they don't have good homes and then they don't have almost everything they need for life. And then we have the ghetto. So the ghetto are people who are barely making it. They are barely surviving. They have very small houses. There are very many people in a small space because the houses are very small. And in the ghetto, uh, these ghettos are usually in the capital city and also in other major cities in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the ghetto of Nairobi. It is called the east side, the eastland part of Nairobi. So in the ghetto, Evelyn, we lived in very small houses. My family uh, lived in a one-bedroom house, and we were eight children. So plus my parents, we were 10, and there was always someone else, either a relative from the village who needed to come to Nairobi. or So we were always more than 10 at any one time in that small house. So the only bedroom that was there was, of course, my parents, and the rest of us had to sleep in the kitchen, we had to sleep in the sitting room. This was normal. Even today when you go to the ghetto, this is normal life. This is how people live. So, but... I thank God because um, in my family, despite the poverty, the, the lack of space, the lack of a lot of things, we, we really loved each other. So because of the love in my family, we had a very happy childhood. I, I didn't feel squeezed. None of us ever felt squeezed. We, we didn't even know when we were young, we didn't know that there were children who had their own rooms and, and their own toilet. And this was, it was never heard of. So the whole family had this small house with one toilet, one bathroom, and only one sink. And we were just happy there. But the ghetto posed a lot of dangers for a lot of children and a lot of people growing there. Because of this kind of living, there are very few facilities. So when you get sick, it is possible that there is no good hospital for you to go to. So we saw a lot of people dying for lack of medical attention. And even if the, the medical facilities were there, it is possible that your family cannot afford medical help. We saw a lot of uh, young people, teenagers, and even younger and uh, young adults engage in crime a lot of criminal activities because when people are this poor, then they are willing to do anything to get money for food. So people would get illegal guns and would be involved in a lot of crime. A lot of people, because of the frustration of this kind of life, would get involved in drug abuse and in alcohol abuse. So this is the kind of environment I grew up in. It was dangerous. But by the grace of God, my parents were born again Christians. And I believe this really helped us because my mom used to pray so much. And, and, and by the grace of God, God protected us. My siblings and I, nobody went to crime. Nobody uh, got alcohol problems or alcohol abuse. Nobody ever touched drugs. Nobody ever skip, uh, dropped out of school. In the grace of God, we all stayed together. We used to love each other so much. Even today, the one thing I love about my huge family is, because, is the love that we have. Even now, we still meet with now our spouses and our children. We are such a big group and we have so much fun together. So we were able to stick together. We were able to stay in school. We were able to stay in church. And this helped us to avoid bad company. It helped us to avoid exposure to drugs, to alcohol, to crime, to early pregnancies. Even a lot of my age mates, they got children in their teenage wood. They, 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 they got a lot of problems because they couldn't even take care of those children. So all these were the problems in the ghetto that were driven by the poverty that existed in that environment. Wow, thank you for explaining and taking us into your past. Um what i'm not sure if you pay like bills for going to school and i was wondering in how far um like your parents had to pay the school fees or what it cost them if they were like living in the ghetto to get all of you to school 
Yes. Um, maybe one thing I can tell you is that the age difference between us as siblings was always one year or two years. So we were almost the same age, or despite being very many children. So I'm the second born. My elder sister is only two years older than me. The sister who follows me is just one and a half years younger than me. So it was like this. So we, the children, the ages were very close to each other. When we started school, the elementary part and the kindergarten part, uh, we went, uh, all our lives, we went to government schools. Back then, uh, when we were going to school in the 90s and the early 2000s, the government never used to charge for primary education. This is elementary education. It was free, maybe from, um, from uh, like four years, five years, and then you start grade one at six years, and then all the way until grade eight, education was free. But for, uh, it was free only in government hospitals. The people who didn't live in the ghetto and didn't live in the slums had no need for government hospitals, for government schools. Yeah, it was only free in government schools. Education was free for this young level only in government schools. The people who did not live in the, in these uh, poverty areas did not need the government schools. Why? Because the government schools lacked a lot of facilities. They also lacked uh, luxuries. Like, for example, there was no lunch. We had to go home for lunch or you carry your own lunch pack. But there were private schools that the middle class people and the high, high class people would afford so the difference between the two uh, the two schools that the the private schools had better facilities had less children could offer lunch because the parents would pay and all this but for us we had good classes and government sponsored teachers and facilities but we were very many in a class i remember growing up in my class there were always we were always at least 45 of us in That's one class lot. and we have it's a lot and we have one teacher so you can imagine if you're not self-disciplined and you take it upon yourself to concentrate maybe you're not understanding anything the teacher is saying and the teacher will not notice that you're not following yeah <laughs> so i don't know if, if that's a, a, a question you want to answer but <laughs> uh, have you then been uh, a yeah. student to uh, really listen to the teacher and to like to go to school or was it hard for you no we, we really we had a lot of friends in the ghetto this is the good part of the ghetto <laughs> because of staying so squeezed together, the next family is just right next to your door. And this, so we had a lot of friends and all of us were going to the uh, government school in the ghetto. So we really enjoyed school. School had a big field to play. School was safe. School was actually fun. And, and uh, by the grace of God, we actually did understand what was being taught in school. And we used to pass the national exams very easily. There was a lot of studying at home uh with the, in the little uh, space we had on the table coffee table we didn't have a dining area so we didn't have a I, didn't, I never saw a dining table in my house until many years after i got married because in the ghetto there is no space so you, if you're going to do any studying it's in the sitting room maybe on the coffee table of your squeeze there so we used to enjoy school it was nice for us to go to school We used to look forward to the break time to play and the lunch break and the evening. We used to play so much. We used to play until dark. In uh, When we are coming from school, we used to play outside until now the darkness is forcing us to go home. So the childhood was happy and it was good. We, we enjoyed school. We enjoyed uh, the, the friends. Even today, we have friends who are like our siblings because we grew up so closely together. Then after... Yes, yes. Then after grade eight, we went to high school. The problem came in in high school because now high school, the parents had to pay school fees. I see. Yes. I see. So a lot of children in the ghetto and in the slum areas did not afford high school education. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because now this one uh, had to be paid, and it was not a it was not a little money, and our parents didn't have much. So for my parents, uh, my mom was a teacher, and my dad had a small business. 
So every month they had to save a lot to make sure that they are able to pay our school fees in installments. They could not be able to pay all of it at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the semester. So they got into arrangements with our with our principals in school, with the school management that every time they get something, they, they'll be bringing in installments. So this is how uh, they were able to pay our school fees. All of us went to primary school, all of us went to high school, and all of us went to college and universities. I personally have two degrees, an undergraduate and a master's degree by the grace of God. But my parents were at least able to take me up to the college level. So for the degrees, I had to pay that for myself when I started working. But <laughs> yes, by the grace of God, all the eight of us were able to get a really good education. I like that you always say by the grace of God, because for you, yes. it's uh, just a blessing from God that you were able yes. to do that. Yes, yes. It is not automatic in Kenya. It is possible that I was born in the ghetto and never got my way out and maybe got married at 17. And now I also have seven children and I have no future and no life like this. This it's, this has happened to so many people I know. So for me to be where I am today, everything that happened in our family, everything that has happened to me as an individual is only by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. How then did you met uh, Stefan Matna and Sven Greisert? Ah, Evelyn, this, this is nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> after, after I finished college, I, I started working. At one point, I got a job at the bank. So I have been a banker for 19 years before I started working for B4T Kenya. And uh, when I was working at the bank, then now uh, when I got married, I got out of the ghetto again by the grace of God, because a lot of people in the ghetto get married and still stay in the ghetto. But for me and my husband, God helped us and we were able to move to a better part of the city. And I got a job at the bank. I had already gotten the job at the bank and now we're starting our own life. So I was working at the bank for many years in different positions. I started from entry level and then I kept going up, up again by the grace of God until I had a really good position at the bank. Then I used to work in a, in, in a branch that was near my house. So I was very happy with this because then I didn't have a lot of traffic and I had small children. So you can imagine as a mother, as a wife, as a banker, you want to be close to home so you can balance your life. Uh, so, But uh, around this time, I was also praying to God a lot about my purpose. I felt God was telling me in my heart that he created me to serve him and to serve him in a different capacity. And being at the bank, I am not doing, I am not executing my purpose. So in my heart, I had this very deep prayer that I used to pray very often that, Lord, please help me to know my purpose. So one day as I was praying, God told me what my purpose is. And he told me, Irene, your purpose is to encourage people to live right with me, God, and to hold on to me no matter what. And Evelyn, maybe one day we'll get time, I tell you more about my life and my experiences, but God had prepared me exactly for this purpose. So my purpose is to encourage people to live right with God and hold on to him no matter what. So when, when the Holy Spirit made this very clear in my heart, I, start, I now changed my prayer. I started asking God, so now this is my purpose, but I don't have a platform to execute my purpose. How do I do it? The, all I have is this job at the bank. The job is good. It is uh, helping me and my husband and our family to settle our bills and to live well. But I am not executing my purpose. And this thing really disturbed me in my spirit. I, I, I didn't want a good job. I wanted a job where I'm serving God. So I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. Then one day uh, in uh, 2019, I got transferred from the branch I loved so much to another branch. It's called the Upper Hill Branch. And I was not happy at all. I really fought the transfer. I wanted to stay where I was because where I was was not home. I was able to take care of my family as I worked. But now it became a, a, a transfer that was uh, endorsed by the chief executive of the bank. So I didn't have a choice. So I had to go to the, to the other branch because they needed a branch head for operations. There was no, because uh, a lot of things were going on there and a lot of changes. So I didn't have a choice. After a whole week of resisting, I was forced to go there. 
I had complained, I had appealed, I had done all these things, but the answer was no, 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 just go to Upper Hill. When I went to Upper Hill, branch uh i was not very happy just the only reason i was not happy was just the distance i, I had to drive like an hour from home to that branch and back again an hour and it's for long. this reason yeah it's far it's for a whole hour and, and the traffic for nairobi you would like it so when you come here and you're driving around in the traffic, you'll not like it at all but uh god wanted me there no sooner had i arrived there Less than a month after I settled in my office, Stefan and Sven walked in and, and into my office and they told me about, uh, they wanted me to help them open a bank account because when you're applying for a work permit in Kenya, you must open a bank account so that you can wire the investment money before you are given the, the work permit, which you need to work here. Without an investor permit or a work permit, you cannot do any business in Kenya. So this was my responsibility to support international investors, open bank accounts. And uh, one of the things I used to do is to interview them, uh, asking what they want to come to do in Kenya, what, what trade, what business, and what is the purpose of that business. So when Sven and Stefan walked into my office and I listened to them and what they want to do, I, I was shocked. They looked like two young men from Germany. They have come into an African country in the East Coast of Africa. They don't know the culture. They don't know how dangerous our slums are. They don't know how dangerous it is to reach these women, these poverty prostitute women. In my heart, I just felt compassion for them. I just felt, oh my God, how are they going to do this? This, this? this is a good thing. It's a good thing. It must be from God, but they don't have the machinery. They don't have the network to be able to do this. So in my heart, I just said, uh, I'm going to support them with the work permit process. And I'm going to go out of my way to do even what I don't do for the investors. I will uh, talk to immigration. I will submit what is needed. I'll follow up for them just so the process is easier for them because I know they'll, they'll be in Germany part of the time. But in my heart, Evelyn, I didn't know that these were the people that God is going to connect me with. And I was not even thinking about that at that time. So I continue to support them and I'm also praying for God to give me a platform to execute my purpose because I felt my good job at the bank is not it. There is something else that God is going to bring, but I don't know what it is and I don't know when it was going to come. So I am working at the bank waiting for God to, to bring something else my way, but I don't know what. So you can imagine my shock when one day uh, Sven and Stefan asked for my personal email and uh, wrote to me a very long email explaining the purpose of b 40 Kenya and why they want to come and do what the Lord had sent them here to, to do. And they told me it is Jesus who sent them here. And when I was reading that email, the Lord clearly told me that the platform that you have been asking for is finally here. So if these people ask you to join them, just say yes. Oh, how exciting. Yes, that is what the Lord told me. If they ask you to join them, say yes. So when the Lord told them that I am their CEO in Kenya and they came and offered me that position, I, I was, of course, a bit, um, I was just thinking a, a few things, but the Lord had already told me. So I was able to say yes to the mission. So I resigned from my banking job and joined B4T Kenya. Wow. Oh. That's a, a crazy story, but it's also, again, something where you surely just can say it's by the grace of God. <laughs> yes, this is only by the grace of God. Yes. Yeah. I would never have applied for a job at B4T Kenya because I didn't even know it existed. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I, I, I didn't even want to go to that branch where I met Sven and Stefan. So this was only the hand of God. What did you think in that moment? What did it like mean to you? Lynn, what Stefan and Sven did not know is that the Lord was already having a conversation with me because I was praying about a way to execute my purpose. You see, if I tell you your work is to be a journalist, 
but you have no platform, you have no company, you have no television mm -hmm. station, radio station, or newspaper station that you're working for. So how this, are you uh, going to be a journalist? So this is how it was for me. So they did not know this. So, but for me on my side, God was already preparing me because of the prayer I was praying. So one day, without when they came to my office, one day the Lord told me, see those two gentlemen, Stefan and Sven, and the mission they want to come and they do here. If they ask you to join them, say yes. So it was, I already had the answer, even before they asked. And I could never ask, tell them. Uh, the Lord told me to, uh, to tell, the Lord told me you will ask me. So ask me now. I couldn't tell them anything. So I was just seated, uh, waiting. I didn't know when they were going to ask, whether they were going to ask next year or this year or this month or in a few weeks. I didn't know. But I knew uh, once they explained to me on my personal email about the mission and we had this exchange on email, I was understanding the mission better and better. And the Lord had already told me, this is the platform you're asking for to be able to serve me. I want you to serve me from before to Kenya. So when they asked me, it was easier because the Lord was already speaking to me. So it was easy for me to say yes. When you now like have these women in mind uh, who are like prostituting themselves and then the Sisters for Hope come by and like try to get them out of like this area, um, yeah. what's the process? Um, yeah, so um, when, when I was thinking... Um, when I was thinking about the, the women poverty prostitutes, Evelyn, we, we also have to uh, mention that this is a very disparate position for any woman. No woman wants to live without dignity in, to this level. This is, this is being forced by circumstances. It is being forced by circumstances. Uh, when, when you when you go to the slums like in our country, the situation is worse than you're thinking right now in your mind. It is very, very bad. It is very bad. And so when I started thinking about these women and, uh, and how much uh, impact we can have as a B4T team, uh, Sisters for Hope and us on the business side, the, the co cooperation between the two arms of B4T Kenya. And, and I looked at uh, my job. Maybe uh, I have to tell you that in Kenya, employment is, is, a, is a big problem. So for me to have left my job, this was not a very easy thing. It was scary. Sometimes you think, did I hear the Lord speak to me or did I think about it myself? And if I leave this job and then this mission is not working, what will I do? I have a family. It can take me many years before I'm able to get any other job. So this was scary. It was not something I did sipping a cup of water just very easily. It was something that really required a lot of faith on my side. Mm -hmm. But when I think about these women and how they are living their lives because they are forced, and if there is a chance for me to save a few of them, as I partner in B4T Kenya, then my answer was yes. I am going to sacrifice my banking job. I am going to, to, to risk everything and, and serve God in B4T Kenya. The process is that the B4T Kenya ladies, Svenja uh, and uh, Sandra and their team, they have a, they have a model. They have a, a way, an organi a structure, organization structure, where they reach out to these women and they have uh, women in charge of the whole process and they are able to reach out to these women. And when they reach out to them, they just tell them, um, you know, that Jesus loves them, that they don't have to do this, that there is a better life for them out there, that the Lord is able to take care of them, that if they can just trust in God, they don't have to live like this. Because when you talk to them, they don't like that kind of life. It is very hard for their heart. It's very hard for their soul. As a human being, as a woman, you want dignity, you want privacy, you want to take care of yourself. And so when they see a chance that they can have, uh, that they have a chance to a better life, yes, uh, the Sisters for Hope is able to draw them is able to draw them in and is able to change their how they're thinking about themselves, how they feel about themselves. This is the first transformation. 
B4T Kenya is about transformation. And if we are able to transform these women from how they think low about themselves to start thinking that I am valuable, I don't need to sell my body, I don't need to be misused by men, I don't need to be to, to expose myself like this, because that is the kind of life where men can even kill you after using you because they don't want to pay you or because they don't, you know, it, it's a bad life. It's dangerous. It is degrading. It is a very sad life. So once we change their mind and uh, they come into B40, into Sisters for Hope hands, then Sisters of Hope are, is, are able to, to now start uh, programs with them to encourage them to live right. But it is always the question of after Sisters of Hope have done their work, where do these women go? The Sisters for Hope cannot give them donations forever. That is not a sustainable. You can give them food this week and next week, but after that, where do you take them so that they can be able to get money for themselves in a dignified way? So this is how the process is. Okay. So these women get their mind change or uh, start thinking differently about their worth, and then like there might be uh, some time where they receive money but afterwards you try to uh, like give them an, the the opportunity to have a job in a b4t uh like business area or are they like founding shops or what what opportunities do they have and do they choose or how does that work yeah so once they have come through the sisters for hope the women have um different opportunities what we do on the business side and number one is that um we all we offer skills in different things uh skills that can help them to get employment outside b4t kenya because b4t kenya is very young we don't have a lot of opportunities for all of them but we can be able to offer skills and employ as many as we can as the companies are being founded and as the companies are growing. But the skills, once we give the skills, it is not a master that you work for us. It is also possible that you are working outside Bipoti, Kenya. So for us, what is most important is economic empowerment in one way or another. Whether we offer skills, uh, that things they can do with their own hands, or we offer them um, education on uh, how to do some things that can help them make money, or we employ them when we have the opportunities in our own companies. So whichever way we do it, we leave the woman economically empowered in a way they don't need to go back to the institution. Hmm. Do you have an example story of maybe one woman? Yes, yes, yes. I have more than one woman story, but I will give you one. <laughs> uh, when uh, one of the companies we founded about uh, three years ago was a food company. So the model of this company was uh, we were going to we were going to uh, import rice from our neighboring country where there is a lot of rice available. And uh, then we were going to open rice outlets here in Kenya uh, to be able to sell the rice here locally. So when we started that company, we opened uh, several rice outlets and one of the rice outlets was in an area, slum area called Babandogo. And in this area, Babandogo, we were able to employ two ladies from Sisters of Hope that were very young. These girls are very young. One is called Noel and another one is called Joy. And they were engaging in prostitution in this uh, slum area because they didn't have any other way of life. They came from the village. They came to Nairobi, so they don't have their parents in the capital city. The parents are back in the village. They are alone here in the city. They can't pay rent. They don't have money for food. They don't have a good education. They have no chance of getting out of the slum. So when Sisters for Hope reached out to these women and brought them to our side of the, the business side for employment, we gave them the, the Babadogo outlet. We trained them 
how to do business, how to run cereals outlet. And uh, we let them also use their minds on how we can improve the business. And they came up with very good ideas because the women are brilliant. It's just that they don't have an opportunity. And they told us that even as we are selling rice, customers are always inquiring about beans and other seed, dry cereals. And, and the corn and all these things that people buy together with the rice. And we were able to improve, to increase the variety of this, of this uh, shop and so many other shops we followed suit from this one. And these girls were like uh, 20 years old and 21 year old. They were very young. And one of them already had a child out of this kind of business and, mm-hmm. and had a very deep cut and had a very deep cut on the face, meaning she has ever been attacked as she's doing this business she has ever been attacked and her face was cut across so she has a very big scar on her face showing me the dangers that these young girls have gone through in their young life and this is really is heartbreaking when you look at them and you see how they look and how desperate they are but you know what happened evening when we employed them in this shop we trained them and we showed them some level of trust that we are leaving the store for you two to manage they started changing how they look at themselves. They started believing in themselves. They started being in control. They started bringing ideas of how to improve the business. They started dressing differently. Even their own hairstyle changed. Even their own dressing changed. Even how they speak changed. Even how they interact with other people. When they came, they were very timid. They didn't have any confidence. Suddenly, they started talking to suppliers. They started telling me we can get a cheaper supplier locally. We can get this and this. And I was looking at them. After six months, after eight months, I'm thinking, are these the same girls I employed? They have changed so much. And they look so much better. And they are dressing decently. You know, and they come even, the, the, the dressing is not decent. It's too less. It's too short. It's too open. It's because of how they view themselves. But with time, they start buying decent clothing. They start telling me they're sending money to their parents back at home. They are able to do this and this for themselves. The rent is suddenly not a problem. They started telling me they are thinking of one, two, three. They want to now go for hairdressing courses. And I was shocked that now they're even thinking about their future. So this is the kind of transformation that we have seen uh, with these women that we interact with. And we are so grateful to God for this. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing the story. It makes it so much more easy to, to display it. Um, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now you are working with uh, Germans, you are working with uh, Stefan and Sven. Um, maybe can you tell us, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I guess there will be some Germans who listen to it. Um, what are differences or also challenges uh, by working with uh, Germans for you? <laughs> Wow, thank you, Evelyn, for that question. That's a good question. Working with Germans can be a very unique experience for Kajans. Uh, Germans work very differently from us. So working with Germans is usually characterized by a blend of cultural differences, but also mutual respect. One thing I like about uh, Sven and Stefan is that they understand there is a big difference as far as culture is concerned. The cultural difference will always affect how people interact. And uh, my experience with the Germans I have come across because it's, I have worked with, because it's not only Stefan and Sven, we have other Germans who are supporting us in one way or another or have visited the organization to see what we do. But one thing I have come to learn very easily about Germans is that they are respectful people. So they, they understand that they are different. They understand that they are dealing with Africans. So they do not expect us to be like them. And and for me, this has been um, has has made it possible for me to work uh, with my directors, Sven, Sven and Stefan. Germans are all often seen by Kenyans as as being very punctual and detail oriented. They like details and they are very direct in their communication. If he doesn't like something, he'll tell you, "No, this is very bad. I don't like this. Do it." 
do it again and do it in another way. So they have a different way of communicating. They have uh, extra uh, details. They, they are extra focused and detailed, and they are also very punctual. Kenyans, on the other way, on the other hand, are very diverse. They have a very flexible approach to business. It's a little different, but the outcome, I believe, is the same as that of the Germans. So despite this uh, difference, as long as there is open communication and there is mutual respect, it's very easy to blend in and still be able to work effectively together. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure we can learn from each other. Um, sometimes I, I think it would be so much more convenient in a personal level if we as Germans wouldn't try to always be that punctual and would maybe just take the time to talk to a person I meet on the street because maybe that's on that point so much more important than being punctual so yes that's just one yeah. one thought I had in my mind <laughs> um yes yes <laughs> I was also thinking about um, what it means for you to follow Jesus with your work. I mean, you already said that it uh, costed something from you uh, to to actually take that job because it was a, a big decision for you. Um, but yeah, maybe you can you can say more to that. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, like I said, if, if I used to work in a first world country um, like Germany, where you can uh, drop your job, you can quit your job today and get another one tomorrow, it would not have been a, a sacrifice for me to join B40 Kenya. Because I would always know if I quit my job at the bank and I join B40 Kenya and I feel it's not working, I can always get another job the next day. This is not so in Kenya. Even with very serious qualifications, you can stay here for many years without a job. So for me, uh, following Jesus in my work, uh, it simply means letting Jesus do his will in everything that I do. If, um, um, if Jesus says, quit your banking job that you have done for 19 years, that is very stable and has given you a stable income and promotion opportunities every now and then to, to start a mission and become a missionary in your own country, then I say yes. Because for me, I made a decision to just let Jesus have his will. I don't want to impose my will in B40 Kenya. I want to follow the will of Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit to tell me, Irene, this, this uh, kind of um, work, I want you to do it like this, like this, like this. Because it's not my work. I, I didn't train to become a missionary in Kenya. I am a, I, my, my background is banking and finance. So for now that I am doing the work of God, for me, it just simply means... Um, doing the will of God in B40 Kenya by asking him to direct all my decisions and my actions. And I pray for B40 Kenya daily. I pray for our directors. I pray for our staff. And that all of us will experience the direction of the Holy Spirit who is in us so that we are able to work together. The Bible says that uh, Paul uh, was telling the churches, he was visiting that, that let all of us be of the same mind and of the same spirit. So if all of us are working together and, and uh, despite the organization and the hierarchy in the in B40 Kenya, but we are all sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we will end up doing more and achieving more. And this is how I follow Jesus in my work. Thank you. Um, if you like maybe think 10 years ahead or 20, what would you like Kenya B40 would look like? Wow. Berlin, in the years to come, my biggest wish for the future of B40 Kenya is for, uh, is for it to have great social impact. When, when we transform the life of one woman, it is not only her life that is transformed. You transform the life of her children. You transform the life of her husband. You transform the lives of the people around her because women are like this. If you transform, our, if, if you empower a woman economically and transform her life, the children go to school, the children eat better meals. So now the nutrition is better. The children are healthier. 
they are growing up seeing their mother living a dignified life. So the effect, the ripple effect is very big. So when you say you have transformed one woman, you, it is possible that you have transformed up to 10 people around her who are watching her, who are feeling the effect of that change, who are receiving the benefit of her empowerment. So for me, my wish for the future of B4T Kenya is that B4T Kenya will grow, will become more established, and will have great social impact, that many lives are transformed, and that B4T Kenya lives to be 300 years old and keeps on transforming lives until Jesus comes back. <laughs> yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I <would> pray yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have faith that it is working until Jesus comes back. Yes, <laughs> very good. Yeah. Um, do you have like a thought or uh, something you want to tell the listeners for now? <laughs> uh, my parting shot for now. Uh, maybe I would tell the listeners that um, even as we do our work and go about our daily businesses, it is important for us as Christians, and especially as born-again Christians, to always ask God what he would want us to do for him. Because it is possible that we are in our big offices, in our comfortable jobs, but that is not exactly where Jesus wants us to serve him. When all of us were created by God, there is an assignment, a purpose that he had for each one of us. So we need to ask ourselves, are we executing our purpose? Are we serving God in the right area that he created us to serve him? And once we are able to answer this question, we'll be able to be doing the right thing that we were created to do for the glory of God. Danke für Ihr Interesse und dass Sie so Teil von Gottes Mission sind. Wenn Ihnen der Podcast gefällt, dann abonnieren Sie ihn gerne oder schreiben Sie uns eine Bewertung. Damit helfen Sie, dass noch mehr in Gottes weltweites Wirken mit hineingenommen werden. Übrigens, dieser Podcast ist werbefrei und kostenlos und das bleibt auch. Die Arbeiten der Allianz Mission werden ermöglicht durch Spenden. Unterstützen auch Sie uns gerne mit Ihrer Spende unter allianzmission.de slash spenden.